follow those directions. Okay, picking up with Act 3, Scene 1, and we're going to finish as you like it today. Um, we're going to try to do Twelfth Night in a little over a day, and I'm probably going to adjust the syllabus a little bit. Um, I think by taking out the in-class exam and making that a take-home exam. Might actually break that exam up into two exams. I'm one over the comedies, then one over the histories. Um, so Act 3, Scene 1. We see, or the act begins with Duke Frederick and his followers. Um, speaking, or Duke Frederick, speaking with his followers. Okay, And he says, not see him since? Sir, sir, that cannot be, but were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge, thou present. In other words, if I weren't such a merciful man, you'd be dead already. Okay? But look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoe'er he is, seek him with candle, bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Okay, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Oliver. So he wants Oliver to find his younger brother, Orlando, bring him to him, dead or alive, and if he doesn't, then what will happen to Oliver? Banished. Or banished, okay? He says, or thou no more to seek a living in our territory. He's going to usurp all his lands and property, okay? Title. We're going to see that same idea brought up in some of the history plays. It's an idea that kind of was going through Shakespeare's mind, apparently. Thy lands and all thy things that thou dost call thine, with seizure do we seize into our hands, till thou. In other words, he's not going to wait until Oliver doesn't do what he asks. He's saying, I'm taking everything you own now. When you bring me Orlando, then I'll give it back to you. <clears throat> all right? So... Oliver replies, oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. In other words, kind of, why are you punishing me? More villain thou. What's Frederick mean? That's one reading. What's another one? You know, we, we talked with Midsummer Night's Dream about the, the great chain of being, okay? Well, what was the first... I can't ask that question. I was going to say what was the first sin, but that's different. What was the first murder? Brother against brother. Brother against brother goes against... Um, Fratricide, suicide, um, patricide, killing one's parents, or more literally, killing one's father, matricide, killing one's mother, all those go against the very heart of society. Why? Because the family is the basis of everything. Okay. So he's saying, more villain thou. Notice, you are a villain. More, you're an even greater villain than I thought of you. And he's not saying, you know, way to go, man. Really go all Marvel, you know, villainish. So we leave them and we get 3-2. Orlando comes in with a paper and he's nailing these papers onto trees. Hang there my verse and witness of my love and thou thrice crowned queen of night. Survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. How is he speaking? What is he speaking in? Verse. Rhyme. Verse. Okay. O Rosaline, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll character. Character means right. Okay. So that later on we're going to see in Hamlet, or if you go to the play, hopefully they haven't omitted this line, Polonius will tell his son, look thou character. And he seemingly gives him a piece of paper. 
But there's another way of understanding that lie. I mean, here, character clearly means I will write my thoughts in the books. But character can also mean what? One's character, one's characteristics, one's traits, one's personality. Okay? So he goes on, and obviously he's what for Rosalind? Medley in love. Okay? So we see Corn and Touchstone come in. And they talk a little bit, because Orlando has left. And let's see here. Corrin, uh, Touchstone asks Corrin if he's ever been in the court, or at court. No, truly. Then thou art damned, I, I, I hope. Truly thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg. For not being at court, explain your reason. Why, if thou never wast at court, thou never sawst good manners. Now that's kind of what the people at court think. <laughs> if thou... Never saw good manners, then thy manners must be, if they're not good, he's implying they've got to be the opposite. What's the opposite of good? Evil. Wicked. And wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state. Now, this is one way of reasoning. It's not the best. But notice what Shakespeare is doing here. The court equals civilization, good manners, Good morals, the wood equals lack of civilization, lack of good manners, lack of good, but he's doing it in a comedic way. He's not literally saying to not be a court is to be a sinner, because notice whose mouth he puts that in. Touchstones, okay? Not a wit, touchstone. Those that are good manners at the court or as ridiculous in the country as the behavior of the country is most mockable at the court. Is Corrin saying, no, 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 manners are entirely relative? Not quite. You told me you salute not at the court, but you kiss your hands. That is, that you don't salute those who are of higher authority, but you do what? You kiss their hands. That would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. Why? What are shepherds doing with their hands? Working with the animals. You want to go up and kiss somebody's hand who's been shoveling, you know, crap out of stables and such? Okay. So, they talk back and forth quite a bit. And Touchstone says, um, or Corin says, you have too courtly a wit for me. I'll rest. That is, I'm done. There's no sense talking with you. Wilt thou rest damned? Okay, now, it's meant to be funny, but Touchstone uses rest, I think, here in the biblical sense. That is, Shakespeare knows that a certain level of his audience is biblically aware. Why? They've had the printing press for over 100 years. They've had the Bible in English for 50 years. Not much more than that. But it's been in English. It's been available. Rest. There's an Old Testament word. Gets adopted also into the New Testament. Okay. Still used in many churches, etc. What is that word? Sabbath. Or <coughs> That's what that word means. Rest. Wilt thou rest? Wilt thou seventh day? Kind of, you know. On the seventh day, God rested. He Sabbathed. Okay. Wilt thou rest? What he says. Damned. That's not rest. To be damned is to be not in a state of peace or rest. God help thee, shallow man. God make incision in thee. Thou art raw. Look at your gloss, 69. Incision, a cut, perhaps for the purpose of letting blood. That is, to let the evil kind of 
out of you. Here, your editor, Bevington, says, to let out folly, to drain the foolishness from you, perhaps for seasoning, as raw meat is scored and salted before cooking. Because what does he follow it? Thou art raw. In other words, you've got to be better. What are you doing when you're seasoning meat? Like you, you pull a steak out and you marinate it in something. What are you doing it? Why are you doing that? Enhancing the flavor. Okay. To preserve it. Is it preserving? If you get ready to cook it later that day, you're not preserving it. It adds character. If you're soaking it in salt, you're preserving it. Does it add character? You're preparing it. You're preparing it for something. He is suggesting here, okay? God needs to cut you. Why? So that you are prepared for what? Your rest. Okay? So that you get ready for it. He's saying, get ready for death. Okay? Sir, I am a true laborer. What's he mean? I don't rest. I don't go into all this thinking stuff. Okay? Yeah, and I don't rest. I'm a true laborer. I earn that what I eat. Get what I wear. Oh, no man hate. Okay. That's part of the preparing for, he hates no man. Envy no man's happiness. Glad of other men's good. Content with my harm. How's, how can you be content with, my, with your own harm? It's St. Paul's idea of be content in all things, except that everything happens, happens, Romans 8, 28, for good, okay? And the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. That is, my greatest joy is to see my farm animals doing what farm animals ought to do. He goes, Phew. That's sinful, because what are you doing? I mean, you're acting like a pimp to those ewes by bringing them to those rams. Okay? Touchstone takes everything and turns it on its head. All right? So, skip to the next page and enter Rosaline reading. What's she reading? Yeah, a song that she pulled off a tree. And we read, now, notice the end rhyme on these lines. You have to figure out how, how does it rhyme, or does it? Because not all these sounds in Shakespeare's day rhymed. Some of them were end, some of them were ein. From the east to western, it's not ein, it's end. India. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind, but her name should be Rosaline. Her worth being mounted on the wind through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosaline. Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosaline. It's almost like he's not quite sure which. Touchstone, I'll rhyme you so eight years together, dinners and suppers and sleeping hours accepted. It is the right butter woman's shut up, she says. And so he goes on. He, Orlando, in the paper, she reading it. If a hard do like a, lot, a hind, let him seek out Rosaline. If the cat will after kind, so be sure will Rosaline. Winter garments must be lined. <laughs> so much slender Rosaline. I told you, Shakespeare never met a pun he doesn't like. Okay. They that reap my sheaf and bind, then to cart with Rosaline. Sweetest nut as sourest rind, such a nut as Rosaline. He that sweetest rose will find, must find love's prick in Rosaline. Again, another pun there. Okay. So, she talks with Touchstone, Celia. Celia reads another poem, and I'm going to skip a little bit. And Rosaline, you know, kind of uh, plays literary critic and says around line 162, yeah, I heard them all. 
And more too, for some of them had in them more feet than the verses would bear. In other words, the verses are supposed to be, supposedly, everyone believes, Shakespeare writes in, iambic pentameter. Ten feet, okay? Ten syllables. But sometimes he doesn't. Her point is, he's not keeping the meter. Some of his lines have ten syllables, some of them have less, some of them have more. Okay. So Rosaline asks Celia, do you know who wrote these? And she says, yes. Is it a man? She kind of, yes. 178, she replies, and a chain that you once wore about his neck. It is a man, and the man wears about his neck a chain you once wore. That is her, what's called paraphrastic way. Paraphrastic means you walk around it. Way of saying, man, it's Orlando. Because what did she do to Orlando before he left? She gave him the necklace. Right? So they keep talking back and forth. And Rosaline says, line 191, good my complexion. Dost thou think, though I am comparisoned, dressed like a man, I have a doublet and hose in my disposition? That is, do you think my disposition, my characteristics, my traits are also like a man's? What does she mean? That I can be patient? That I can hide my feelings? One inch of delay more is a South Sea of discovery. Tell me, who is it? Quickly, speak. I would thou could stammer that thou mightest pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of a narrow mouth bottle. Either too much at once or none at all. Prithee, take the cork out of thy mouth that I may drink of thy tidings. <laughs> so you may put a man in your belly. Now notice, Celia sees the metaphor Rosaline is talking about. Pour this man out of your mouth. Give me his name. Okay. Rosaline says, and see, he says, why? So you could take him in your belly? Well, belly has multiple meanings in Shakespeare's day. Okay. Is he of God's making? What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard? Head worth a head, that is, is he of high standing? Is he old enough to have a beard? And she goes, man, eh, he's got a little beard. Not, not much. Well, God will send him more. Celia so finally, you know, it is young Orlando that tripped up the wrestler's heels <laughs> and your heart. She said, don't lie to me. Speak true. See, alas the day, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? In other words, Orlando, here, and here I am dressed like a man. I can't read him like this. You know, I was going to ask this on the, on the, um, quiz, but I thought, you know, I've not talked about it. It's mentioned in the um, introduction. I don't know what you know about English theater history. Who played the role of Rosalind? A young boy. A young boy, okay. Who played all the roles of women? Young boys and or men. Okay. So you have a man, we'll say, a boy, playing Rosalind playing Ganymede playing Rosalind. You talk about ginger bending, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shakespeare's playing with his viewers' minds, okay? What shall I do? And then notice what does she do? What does she do? Rapid fire questions. What did he when thou sawest him? What said he? How looked he? Where and went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How parted he with thee? And when shalt thou see? Answer in one word. She's like, how do I answer all those questions in one word? What is Rosaline showing us? She has it just as bad for Orlando as he has it for her. She's just not going around and writing in sonnets and putting them on trees. Or writing what should be sonnets, but aren't sonnets, okay? So she asks, does he know I'm in this forest? 
Does he look as freshly as he did when he wrestled? Okay. So, um, let's skip a bit. Jaques comes in with Orlando. Celia and Rosaline stand aside. Okay, keep in mind, they're both dressed as, well, Rosaline is. Celia's dressed as Eliana. Okay. Has she, has she done something to her face so that she doesn't look like Celia? We're not told. Jaques comes in. There's Orlando. And Jaques says, God be with you. Let's meet as little as we can. God be with you. Goodbye. That's what goodbye means. Okay? What's he really saying? It's like Bilbo Baggins, um, after he's tired of Gandalf asking him questions at the beginning of The Hobbit. You know, when he first meets Gandalf, he says, good morning to you. And then after a bit of conversation, he says, good morning. And Gandalf goes, look at you. You use good morning to mean two exactly opposite things. The first one was a welcome. Now you're telling me to go away. Okay. God be with you means go away. <laughs> okay. Orlando, I do desire we may be better strangers. You got to love Shakespeare's command of the land. What does that mean? How do you be better strangers? See each other less. So let's improve our strangerness. Go away. So they're both telling each other, go away. Jaquies, quit marring the trees with writing love songs in their barks. I pray you mar no more my verses with reading them ill-favoredly. Quit misreading my poems, Orlando says. So Jake Weiss asks a question. He wants to find out, you know, am I misreading? Rosaline is your love's name? Yes, Jess, I do not like her name. There was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. One of Shakespeare's great little put-downs, you know. What stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. Now, he means she reaches up to my heart. She fills his heart. He doesn't necessarily mean she's this tall. Because in all the productions I've seen of As You Like It, Rosalind's usually about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, and Orlando is not 6'4", or 6'5". Okay? Jake, you are full of pretty answers. Have you not been acquainted with Goldsmith? Et cetera, et cetera. So they keep talking back and forth. They talk about being in love. And Jaquie says, 280 or so, by my trough, by my faith, I was seeking for a fool when I found you. I was looking for a fool when I found you. He sang, I found one. Orlando, he's drowned in the brook. Look. But in, and you shall see him. Playing on the Narcissus myth. There I shall see mine own figure, which I take to be either a fool or a cipher, a symbol. You're either going to see a real fool yourself or a symbol of a fool. Okay. So Rosaline says to Celia, I'll speak to him like a saucy lackey. And under that habit, play the knave with him. In other words, I'm going to joke around with him. She's not saying I'm going to test or try his love. Right? So she goes up to him. Uh, do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you are? What is it, a clock? And he tells her. You should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest, else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as of the clock. So they talk about time and such. They talk about love. They talk about lawyers. And Rosaline says, line 350, I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There's a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosaline on their barks. 
hangs odes upon Hawthorne's elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. 357, the quotidian, fever recurring daily. Love sickness. Right? Orlando, that's me. Tell me your remedy. How do I get out of this? He says. She says, there's none of my, she says, there's none of my uncle's marks upon you. Well, what were his marks? And she describes the symptoms of love sickness. He says, I would, I would make you believe I am in love. She says, me believe it. You might as soon make her believe it. Her who? Her that you say you love. Now the audience is sitting down there going, oh, that, that's pretty good. This is, that is one of the points in the which women still give the lie to their conscience. But in good sooth, are you he? And she says, I am. Okay. So she explains how she once made someone who was in love fall out of love. How did she do that? She pretended to be his love. Okay. And tested him. Orlando, I would not be cured. Line 4 or 13 or so. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosaline and come every day to my coat and woo me. And he says, I will. I will. Okay? So, as Ganymede, she says, I'm going to pretend to be your Rosaline. You're going to come to me every day. What's he supposed to do? Swear his love to her. Him. Sorry. Okay? Pretend to be. Jaques comes in with Audrey and Touchstone and such. And Touchstone gives us a line, line 12 in the next act. Back up to line 10. When a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit seconded with the forward child, understanding, it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. And if you read your gloss, many scholars, I know Bevington says some scholars, many scholars have taken that to be an allusion to the murder of Christopher Marlowe in 1593. Right? He was murdered in a pub, just outside a pub, a tavern, in Deptford, which is just outside London. Today it's actually kind of considered part of the outside environs of London, of, excuse me, London, okay? Stabbed by Ingram Freiser at an inn in Deptford in a quarrel over a tavern reckoning, meaning a bill, a bill. Like he hadn't paid up for his drinks that night. It's thought he was murdered over this because we do know Christopher Marlowe was a spy for Queen Elizabeth. Christopher Marlowe was given a master's degree from Cambridge University because Queen Elizabeth ordered Cambridge to do that. Cambridge was the university primarily where Protestants went. Oxford is where more Catholics went, even though they both had to swear the oath of supremacy. That is, their allegiance to the English church and to the monarch. Okay? We know some Catholics probably did not get degrees because they wouldn't swear the oath of supremacy. John Dunn is supposed to have attended Oxford, but he never got a degree. His whole family was Catholic. He had uncles who were killed, for, and uncle, etc. Okay? Marlowe, we know, and it's pretty clear people in his own day knew, was an atheist. How do you swear allegiance to the English church? When you don't believe anything the church teaches. Okay. Anyways. So this is a little possible allusion to um, that event. Um, they talk back and forth. Sir Oliver comes in. And let's see. Now we can skip. End of that act, excuse me, end of that scene. Touchstone 
Tell, says to Audrey, line 58, excuse me, line 88, Come, sweet Audrey, we must be married or we must live in Baudry. That is, illegitimately, you know, etc. So they go off to get married. Act 3, scene 4, Rosalind and Celia come in. Um, and they talk about Orlando and such. Sylvius comes in. 3, 5, Sylvius and Phoebe come in. And, and then Shakespeare introduces kind of a new or an additional subplot in more difficulty. Why? Because we're going to see, or as we've already seen, Orlando, oh, let's just be silly, hearts, you know, <clears throat> Rosaline, <clears throat> Rosaline, Hearts Orlando, Sylvius, Hearts Phoebe, Phoebe, Hearts Ganymede. But Rosaline is Ganymede. So he's introducing a similar problem as we saw in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. So they go back and forth. We hear a lot of talk. And uh, we can skip most of that. Let's see here. Can we? Rosaline tries to convince Silvius that he shouldn't really love Phoebe. That she's not worthy of him. Let me pick up with um, line 49. You foolish shepherd. This is Act 3, scene 5. Wherefore do you follow her? Like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain. You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that makes the world full of ill-favored children. You, coupling with the likes of her, make ill-favored children. Why? She's not deserving of you. Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her. She's also saying, Phoebe's not necessarily pretty enough for you. All right? And out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. Because of you, Phoebe what? Has a higher view of herself than her lineaments. That's her body. That's the joinings, the connections of her body. What? Can show her. But mistress, know yourself. All right? She's telling Phoebe. Phoebe, beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> you better take what's being offered to you, because this is about the best, you know, opportunity you're going to get. Down on your knees and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. Now, it might be that Phoebe's not young. It might be Phoebe's, you know, a little bit past her prime. You are not for all markets. Not everyone's going to love you. Here you found someone who dotes on you. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Foul is most foul. Being foul to be a scoffer. She is scoffing at Sylvius's love, Phoebe's. And she says, she, Rosaline, is saying, that is most foul. It's most abhorrent, kind of to nature. So take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well, Phoebe. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I had rather hear you chide than this man. In other words, oh, 
your voice. Okay? So when Rosaline slash Ganymede speaks horribly to Phoebe, Phoebe falls in love with her. Whatever. <laughs> okay? So Rosaline says, don't fall in love with me. I am falser than vows made in wine. She's speaking truth, right? Because I'm not really me. That is, I'm not who you think I am. So she says to Eliana, come sister, shepherdess Phoebe, look on him, Silvius, better. And be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Though all the world could see, look at your gloss. Though all the world could see, could look at you, none could be so abused in sight as he, deceived through the eyes. We're being told, and I know our modern audiences, we don't like to, you know, well, that's not nice. Shakespeare's not being nice. Phoebe should not be attractive. In fact, Phoebe should be relatively ugly. Okay? But Silvius is so enamored of her, what does he take her to be? A rose. A beauty. That's why Rosaline says, though all the world could see, though all the world could see you, that is, he won't. <laughs> he won't see you as you really are. Dead shepherd, now I find I saw of might. Who's the dead shepherd? Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Okay? Dead shepherd, Christopher Marlowe. I want to say that Hero and Leander, where he says that, but I might, I might be wrong. I don't think he did. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's right there. For Marlowe's Hero and Leander, Sestian. 1, 176, first published in 1598. So that gives us a date, okay? This play could not have been written before 98. It's assumed it's written around 1599. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Phoebe's talking about herself. She loves Ganymede. But who does it also apply to? It applies to Silvius. Okay? Line 90, Phoebe says, in response to Silvius, thou hast my love. Is not that neighborly? Silvius, I would have you. I would have you, Silvius says to Phoebe. Why? That were covetousness. Shakespeare keeps bringing up these ideas of sins. Okay? Covetousness is what? It's one of the biggies. It's there in the Ten Commandments. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love. Time was, and yet it is not. That is, and I still don't bear you love. But the implication is, I no longer hate you. It's kind of more what? I don't really care anything about you. But since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company which erst was irksome to me, I will endure, and I'll employ thee too. Why? Because he can teach her how to talk about love. Sylvia is so holy and so perfect as my love, and I in such a poverty of grace. Holy grace. Okay? The play is loaded with religious language. And I in such a poverty of grace that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. If I can stay with you, you and hear you talk about Ganymede, he says, I will what? I will glean the ears of the crops. What, are, what does gleaning the ears of the crops mean? Right? It means going after the reapers. After the reaper has gone over the field and pulled all the crops. Well, what is always left behind? There's always ears of corn left. And the gleaner is the one who goes and gleans that, gets the leftovers, gets the dregs. He says, I will take the dregs from your mouth. 
Are they directed at him? No. They're directed at Ganymede. So what for him is gleaning the ears? It's just hearing her voice. Right? Loose now and then a scattered smile. That is, and just smile every now and then. It's not even smile at me. It's just smile. And what? And I'll live upon it. Okay? Very Petrarchan imagery as we talked about the other day. So, Phoebe, do you know who that youth was that we were talking to? Notice, what does she, how does she respond to his speech? Like, like she was deaf. She doesn't respond at all. Okay? So, she says, think not I love him, though I ask for him. It's but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well. But what care I for words? She's going to go on and give a speech. And what is she doing in the speech? No, 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 no. I don't love him yet. He talks well. He walks well. He looks well. He sounds well. He appears well. Okay. And she convinces herself she is in love with him. Act 4, scene 1. Um, Jigwees and Rosaline enter with Celia and Jigwees says, a pretty, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. Now why does he want to be better acquainted with Rosaline, but he wants Orlando to go away? Well, for one reason, what's Orlando been doing to all the trees in the forest? Oh, Du Bois plus, you know, our daughter of Duke Senior kind of a thing. He's been defacing them. Okay? Rosalind, they say you are a melancholy fellow. I am so. I do love it. Better than laughing. He loves melancholy? That's weird. Okay? There's just no other way to describe this. Those that are an extremity of either, either what? Laughing or melancholy, right? So those that are an extremity of either, in other words, those who are not what? Moderate. Here's this idea of moderation. Those that are an extremity of either are abominable fellows and betray themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards, right? If you're excessively full of laughter or you're excessively full of melancholy, everybody censures you. Jake reads, why, tis good to be sad and say nothing. Why then, Rosaline says, tis good to be a post. Dead. That's the implication of her words. Might as well be a two by four as be a person and not express what you are thinking, feeling. Jaquees, I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, that is pretending, right? nor the musician's, which is fantastical, nor the courtier's, which is proud, nor the soldier's, which is ambitious, nor the lawyer's, which is politic, nor the lady's, which is nice, meaning fastidious, Right? nor the lovers, which is all of these. Right? But it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, and indeed the sundry contemplation of my travels, in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. So what kind of melancholy is he talking about? Everybody in this room, I think, has probably experienced this at one time or another. It's you get into this mindset, this ruminative mindset, and you're kind of down or depressed. And what happens? I mean, we have this phrase for a reason. A pity party. But what is it? It's, it's more than this. 
it means kind of a celebration, a, an enjoyment of sadness. Like a certain song can bring on this mindset and you just kind of sit there and go, like sitting in a sauna, oh, it feels so good. That is, the sadness just kind of makes you feel good, even though you're sad, right? That's what he's getting at. Look at your gloss there for those lines 15 through 19. His melancholy, made up of many ingredients extracted from the many objects of my observation and indeed from the diversified considerations of my travels, my frequent rumination upon which wraps me in a most whimsical and moody sadness. Rosalind, you're a traveler. Well, that explains everything. By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. To have seen much and to have nothing. She says, you sold your lands to do what? To go look at other people's. Well, what happens when he's done looking at other people's? He's got nothing. Okay. She says, your experience makes you sad. I had rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad. And you travel for it too. That is, and you traveled, you, you went away somewhere for what purpose? To become sad? Okay. So, Jaquies leaves, Orlando comes in. Why? How now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You a lover? And you serve me such another trick? Never come in my sight more. Why? What did he say when he last spoke with Ganymede? He said, I'll be here at a certain time. Look at his reply. My fair Rosaline, he's speaking to Ganymede, pretending to be Rosaline. My fair Rosaline, I came within an hour of my promise. That is, I'm only an hour late. Breaking hours, promise and love. He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of the thousand, part of a minute in the affairs of love. It may be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him on the shoulder and I'll warrant him heart whole. In other words, if you really loved me, you wouldn't have been the thousandth of an hour late. You'd have been here early. <laughs> Pardon me. She goes, no, you, you do this again. Don't come in my sight. Okay. So they talk about a snail, and she says, the snail brings his destiny with him. And he asks, well, what is that? And she says, why horns? Why? Because it's the image of the cuckold. The man whose wife cheats upon him. So then they start to talk about virtue. Orlando, line 59. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosaline is virtuous. And I am your Rosaline. Celia, it, it pleases him to call you so, but he hath a Rosaline of a better leer than you. Come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now if I were your very Rosaline? I would kiss you. She goes, no, you better speak first. So they keep talking back and forth. And um, 79. She says, if I were your mistress, marry that should you, if I were your mistress, or I should think my honesty thank her than my wit, rank her than my wit. He says, what of my suit? Okay. Now, that can mean what of my clothing. It can also mean what? His suing her for love. Not taking her to court. This is his wooing her, her, his courting her. What of my suit in love? Okay. Not out of your apparel and yet out of your suit. Am not I your Rosaline? He says, I take some joy to say you are. In other words, I'm playing your little game, pretending that you are, because I would be talking of her. The only reason I'm doing this is what? I can keep saying her name. That's kind of the implication there. All right? 
Well, in her person, I say I will not have you. In her person. In her stead. <clears throat> but what does she mean? This is dramatic irony, right? She also means, well, as her, because she really is Rosaline, he says, well, then in mine own person I die. No, faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and all this time there's not any man died in his own person. Vitalis it in a love cause. No one died for love. Troilus had his brains dashed out with a Grecian club. Yet he did what he could to die before. He is one of the patterns of love. Shakespeare wrote a play, Troilus and Cressida. Okay. Leander, he would have lived many a fair year, though Hero had turned none, if it had not been for a hot midsummer night. Talking about jumping in the river and such. Okay. So they keep going back and forth. Orlando says, wilt thou have me? About, I don't know, 110 or so. I and 20 such. Yes, I'll have you. You, Orlando. And I'll have you, this man, and you, this man, and you, this man, and you, this man. What's Rosaline saying? Rosaline slash enemy slash Rosaline. <laughs> yes. Women are unfaithful. Okay. She's testing Orlando to see whether maybe, I mean, this is one possible reading, maybe he'll fess up and say, yeah, you're right. What sayest thou? In other words, what? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then can one desire too much of a good thing? In other words, you say you're good. If I'm Rosaline and I say you're good, well, then two of you would be what? Yeah, exactly. Double good. And four of you would be quadruple good. And five of you would be quint. Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say? Orlando, marry us. I can't, I can't say the words. You must begin. Will you, Orlando... Will you, Orlando, have the wife this Rosaline? I will. Ros when? It's almost like she looks at her watch. When? As fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take the Rosaline for wife. I take the Rosaline for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take the Orlando for my husband. There's a girl who goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thought runs before her action. That is, she thinks before she does. Now tell me how long you would have her after you have possessed her. That is, tell me how long you would have her after you have had her. Forever and a day. What's forever and a day? <clears throat> eternity. It's eternity. Okay? Say a day. Without ever. No, no, no. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are made when they're maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. In other words, they don't look the same once they get the ring on their finger. They go from being lover to ball and chain. Okay? Orlando, but will my Rosaline do so? By my life, she will do as I do. I'm telling you, this is how it's got to be. He says, but she is wise. Okay, they keep talking. Orlando says, I gotta go, gotta leave, I got you know something to do, I've got to meet up with the Duke. But I'll be back in two hours. She says, I can't let you two hours. I must attend the Duke. Two, by two o'clock, I'll be with you again. Go, go. I knew what you would prove. In other words, you men, you're all alike. This is what it, you know, this is what your marriage to the real Rosaline will be like. My friends told me, flattering tongue, but 2 o'clock, right? You said 2 o'clock. All right. By my troth. Okay? By my faith. And yet, what has also happened just five minutes before? Not even five minutes. They married. Did they legally marry? No, because Celia is not a minister. Okay? Nor is she a justice of the peace. You could say it's a common law kind of marriage, though, which they did have in Shakespeare's day. So when she also says, by my troth, she's also saying, 
by my pledged faith to you. Will you take this man? And in good earnest, and so God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise or come one minute behind your hour, hour I will think you the most pathetic or break promise, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And he's like, don't worry, I'll be here. I promise, I'll be here. Okay? He leaves Celia. You have simply misused our sex in your love prate. Misused, your glass tells you. Absolutely slandered. It's almost like she's channeling tw late 20th, early 21st century feminists. You just set the cause back years. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head and show the world what the bird hath done to her own nest. In other words, we got to expose you. Rosalind, cuz, cuz, my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love. It cannot be sounded. In other words, I couldn't help myself. My affection hath an unknown bottom. It is so deep it cannot be plumbed. Or rather bottomless, that as fast as you pour affection in, it runs out. No, that same wicked bastard of Venus. Who is that wicked bastard? Cupid. That was begot of thought, conceived of spleen, born of madness, that blind, rascally boy that abuses everyone's eyes because his owner out. Let him be judge how deep I am in love. Now, she's kind of saying, it's his fault. I didn't mean to fall in love. Okay, So, skip 4-2, go to 4-3. Notice, it's after 2 o'clock. Where is he? Celia, I warrant you, with pure love and troubled brain, he hath taken his bow and arrows and has gone forth to stop her. This is what Celia thinks about men in love. Or men who say they're in love. They're what? Sleepy? No. They're liars. They say they're in love for what purpose? Sex. <laughs> okay. And enters, in comes Sylvia's with a letter. And he gives the letter, and Rosaline reads it. Okay. Um, skip down to... When Oliver enters, <clears throat> actually, I'm going to pick up with 92. So Oliver enters, and he addresses Celia and um, Rosaline, and he says, line 92, Orlando doth commend him to you both, that is, himself, to you both, and to that youth he calls his Rosaline. He sends this bloody napkin, and he pulls out a handkerchief, dripping in blood. Are you he? Rosaline, I, I am. What must we understand by this means, explain what this signifies. What does the bloody handkerchief mean? And he explains. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour, and pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. Here's what happened to him. He threw his eye aside and marked what object had presented itself. Under an old oak whose boughs were mossed with age and high top bald with dry antiquity, a wretched ragged man, o'ergrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. About his neck, place, a green and gilded snake, a green and yellow snake, okay, had wreathed itself, who with her head, nimble in threats, approached the opening of his mouth. The snake was getting ready to enter the guy's sleeping mouth. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself, and with indented glides did slip away into a bush, under which bushes shade a lioness, with udders all drawn dry, lay, lay couching, head on ground, with cat-like watch, when that the sleeping man should stir. So, Orlando comes across, some guy sleeping on the ground, 
a snake wound around his neck, getting ready to go into his mouth, probably to strike, not because it wants to sleep there. It sees Orlando, it leaves, it goes off to the bushes where there is a lioness, okay, crouching, just waiting for the man to stir. The royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that does seem as dead. It's not going to eat a dead person. So it's thought. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. So the lioness is waiting to make sure that the piece of meat is actually alive. Orlando moves. Rosalind. But back to Orlando, because they start talking about the elder brother. Did he leave him there? Food to the sucked and the hungry Linus? Why? Because Celia says, oh, I've heard him talk about that, brother. The most unnatural that lived amongst men. Rosaline wants to know, did Orlando let the lion eat him, his most unnatural brother? Twice did he turn his back in purpose, though. That is, he went down and said, huh, that's Oliver. Yeah, well. <laughs> and get up and started to leave. The kindness nobler ever than revenge, and nature stronger than his just occasion. Okay, look at your gloss. Just opportunity for revenge. Made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him. That is, when he twice turns away, he knows there's a lioness there. And the first time he turns away, it's like, see you later, Oliver. And he does it the second time, but then he comes back. And he attacks the lion, in which hurtling from miserable slumber, I awake. Celia, you're his brother. Rosalind, he rescued you. Oliver, yes. Twas I, but... Tis not I. Why twas and tis? Twas. It was I, but it is not I. Not the same brother that was in still Orlando who changed. The brother who fell asleep there. <clears throat> what happened to that brother? He died. He kind of died. He woke up a new man. Who is the servant? I never connected this before. Who is, I mean, I kind of did, but not in this context. Who is the servant to the Dubois family? How's he often called, though? Old Adam. St. Paul's epistles talk about the old Adam. The old Adam must die. Why? So that the new Adam can rise. The old Adam is Adam in the garden. Who's the new Adam? Christ. Okay. Or as St. Paul also puts it, Christ living in someone. The old Oliver dies there. That twas I, but not tis I. I do not shame to tell you what I was. That is, I'm not ashamed to tell you. He accepts his shame. He's, he's saying, i got to be honest. I was a bad person. Okay? Since my conversion so sweetly tastes, it's still in his mouth. Being the thing I am. Okay? He's, he's talking about a real quote-unquote like a religious conversion experience. Is he the only one that's going to have this experience? No. Who else? Duke Frederick. Duke Frederick. How extensive is Duke Frederick's experience? We're going to be told by the end of the play, what kind of life does he take up? One of the questions on the quiz. A religious life. A religious life. It's like he becomes a monk. Okay? So... Oliver explains what happens. When from the first to last betwixt us two, tears are recounting his head most kindly bathed. That's how I came into that desert place. In brief, he led me to the gentle duke who gave me fresh array and entertainment. Fresh array. 
Sorry to keep beating these biblical. What's he mean? He puts on new clothes. It's almost like baptismal gown. He died, metaphorically, and now he's a new person. Okay, so he has new clothes and entertainment, committing me unto my brother's love, who led me instantly into his cave. There stripped himself, and here upon his arm the lioness had torn some flesh away. Oliver hadn't noticed this hunk of flesh missing from Orlando's arm. And what happens? He faints, and his fainting words, Rosaline. He says, I recovered him. He told me about his meeting with you. So here I am. What happens to Rosaline? She faints. And Oliver says to her, 166, be of good cheer, youth. You a man? What does he mean, you a man? Modern English. Man up. You lack a man's heart. She goes, I, I, I do, honestly. <laughs> tell, tell your brother how well I counterfeited. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 that wasn't counterfeit. No, you really fainted. She goes, no, no, I assure you. Acting. Well, take a good heart and counterfeit, pretend to be a man. She says, so I do, but I should have been a woman by right. Okay. 5-1. Uh, we'll skip 5-1. Go to straight to 5-2. Orlando comes in, arm in a sling, with Oliver. Oliver's been telling him about Rosaline slash Ganymede slash Rosaline. Okay. Rosaline comes in, and she says, um, I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. He says, it is wounded, but with the eyes of a lady. Okay. She says, and did your brother tell you how I counterfeited? You know, how, how I, I, I made it look like I really was Rosaline? He says, I had greater wonders than that. Does he know? Yeah. Are you sure? It's not that good. Man, I'm not sure about that, but hold on to that, okay? Page, uh, line 31. She says, your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked. No sooner looked, but they loved. No sooner loved, but they sighed. No sooner sighed, but they asked one another the reason. That is, why are you sighing? No, 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 you first. Why are you sighing? Why? Because neither one wants to be the first one to say, I love you. No sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy. And in these degrees have they made a pair of stairs to marriage which they will climb incontinent or else be incontinent before marriage. They are in the very wrath of love, okay? So, Orlando says they're going to get married tomorrow. And Rosaline tells him, I cannot serve your time for Rosaline. That is tomorrow. Tomorrow I can't be this Rosaline for you. He says, I can live no longer by thinking. That is, I, I can't go on with this shrink. It's not enough. So she says, okay, all right. I will weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose that I know you are a gentleman of good conceit. Okay. I speak not this that you should bear a good opinion of my knowledge and so much. So what does she say? I know a little magic, an old man I once met. And she says, I can do strange things. If you do love Rosaline, line 60, so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Aliena, shall you marry her, Rosaline? I know into what straits of fortune she is driven. It's not impossible. And he goes, you tell the truth? Speaks thou in sober meanings? She says, by my life. Okay. Sylvia and Phoebe come in. And what happens? She tells them. Phoebe says, you've done me much unkindness. Why? Because you showed the letter to Silvius that I wrote to you. Okay? She tells Phoebe, 
You are followed there by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him. Love him. He worships you. Phoebe tells Silvius, Tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears, and so I am for Phoebe. Phoebe, and I for Ganymede. Orlando, and I for Rosaline. Rosaline, and I for no woman. Silvius, it's to be made of faith and service. So am I for Phoebe, and I for Ganymede, and I for Rosaline, and I for no woman. Made all, my, made all of fantasy and wishes and adoration and duty and observance and humbleness and patience and impatience and purity and trial and observance. And so am I for Phoebe, and I for Ganymede, and I for Rosaline, and I for no woman. And this goes on and on and on. So what does Rosaline finally say? She says to Silvius, I will help you if I can. And Silvius is thinking, okay, good. To Phoebe, I would love you if I could. Phoebe's, you know, that's a little bit of hope. Tomorrow, meet me all together. And she says to Phoebe, and I will marry you if ever I marry a woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. Now, Phoebe takes that to me. Wait a second. I will marry you if I'm ever going to marry a woman, and tomorrow I'm getting married. She's going, yes. That's good. That's me. Okay? She says to Orlando, I will satisfy you if ever I satisfy men. Yes, Shakespeare's punning on sexual satisfaction. Satisfaction, and you shall be married tomorrow to Silvius. I will content you if what pleases you contents you, what pleases him, Phoebe, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosaline meet, as you love Phoebe meet, and as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well. So go to Act 5, Scene 4. Duke Sr. comes in and says, Do you think the youth can do everything he promised? I sometimes do believe and sometimes do not. As those that fear, they hope and know they fear. Now your gloss tells you they hope that they merely hope. As those that fear that they merely hope. That is that there's nothing real of substance to their hope. But what does it mean I sometimes do believe and sometimes do not? Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. In other words, belief isn't 100% all the time. There is an element of doubt there. Okay? So, Rosaline comes in as Ganymede and says, um, you, you, you still, you're going to marry Rosaline, right? When I bring her? He goes, yes. And she says to Phoebe, and you say you'll marry me if I'm willing. Right? Phoebe says yes. But if you don't marry me, you'll marry the shepherd, right? Yes. Okay. So she says final words to each of them. Keep your word, keep your word, keep your word. Okay. Touchstone comes in. We find out Touchstone and Audrey have been married. And then Rosaline comes in with Hymen. The God of marriage. The God of weddings. And she turns to the Duke. Which Duke? Her father. To you I give myself, for I am yours. To you I give myself, then to Orlando, for I am yours. The Duke, you're my daughter. <coughs> Orlando, you're my Rosalind. If sight and shape be true, why then, my love, adieu. I'll have no father if you not be if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. To Phoebe, nor ne'er wed woman if you be not she. I'll marry no woman unless you. Right? Okay? Hyman says, here's eight that must take hands to join in Hyman's bands. Audrey, Touchstone, Rosaline, Orlando. Phoebe, Sylvia's got to get them all right. Celia, Oliver. Okay. Jaquies the boys uh, comes in. He's the middle son of the three uh, Du Bois or Du Bois sons. And he says, let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. 
Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this force, addressed the mighty power, which you are on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword, addressed the mighty power, that is, he raised an army to come rout everybody out of the forest. But he came to the skirts of this wild wood where meeting with an old religious man, after some question with him, was converted both from his enterprise and from the world. Converted from his enterprise, he dropped the invasion and he's leaving the world behind. Okay? He is taking up his cross. He is denying himself. All right? So, the other Jake we says, I'm going to go I'm going to go follow him. I'm going to go live with him. Why? Because he says, out of these convertites, converted people, there is much matter to be heard and learned. He wants to know what made him change. This is where Jake shows us his honesty. He's not a mere melancholic because it makes him feel good. He is wrestling with the problems of the world. He is wrestling with the major issues. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Blah, 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 blah. So he says to the Duke, to you, you to your former honor, I bequeath your patience and your virtue well deserves it. He says to Orlando, you to a love that your true faith doth merit. To Oliver, you to your land and love and great allies. To Silvius, you to a long and well-deserved bed. To Touchstone, and you to Wrangling, for thy loving voyage is but for two months vittled. Duke Senior, stay, Jaquies, stay. He says what? No. I would you, I, to see no pastime I, what you would have, I'll stay to know at your abandoned cave. That is, what you would have, what you desire to have, I will find here. Well, what did he desire? What did he discover in his abandoned cave? How sweet are the uses of adversity. <clears throat> Jaques is going to learn there in the wood. And so, Rosaline comes out to give us the epilogue. And she says towards the end, I know it's just a couple minutes late. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the wood. And notice, she says, not every play needs an epilogue. But those with epilogues are better plays. My ways to come. I charge you, O women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. What's the title? As you like it. If you don't like it, don't worry about it. <clears throat> if you do like it, like it as much as you can. To you, O men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering, that is their, you know, that between you and the women the play may please, that there will be concord between you. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that please me. Why? Because everybody out there knows this is a man or boy. Complexions that like me, breasts that I defy not. And I am sure as many as have good beards or good faces or sweet breasts will. What? When I make curtsy, Bid, bid me farewell. That is when I will do what? That's what she means. Okay. Stop there. Twelfth night um, for Tuesday. <clears throat>